We return to Gaydon for this year's Great British Model Railway Show 2023. First up is Life in Longmorn by Ian Lamb and the DAVA Project Group, a 4mm scale OO gauge layout. This layout, constructed as accurately as possible, brought together during the Covid pandemic some of the best railway modellers in the north of Scotland to create a representation of the distillery complex on the southern suburb of Elgin, near the end of Steam, on the line to Aberdeen via Dufftown. It is operated in two sections, the central one displaying the industrial setting of the day, while the outer railway allows mainline trains of the period to be shown. Yeah. <laughs> Next is Edrom by Darren Groff in Engage. This layout is based on the real Edrom station, which is on the now closed Berwickshire line in the Scottish borders between Cherside and Duns. The layout is based in the 1950s to 60s. Whilst trying to remain faithful to the prototype, the only modeler's prerogative is that it is now a GWR line and is signalled as such. Next is a layout I only, only saw two weeks ago at the Great Electric Train Show and it's Rosemary Goods by Neil Woodbine and Susan Farmer in OO Gage. This footage has been brought to you by The Boy and he's filmed it entirely by himself. Not bad, eh? The layout portrays operations during the 1985 to 1987 time period when the rail freight grey livery was starting to appear. Wagon repair traffic for the South Staff's wagon repair works in Tipton can be seen along with the scrap metal working to Norton Barrow at Bilston. Following his successful filming, the boy continues to bring us layouts, this time Reliance Works in O-Gage. The layout has been presented by the Stratford and District Model Railway Club. It's an industrial shunting layout measuring just 5 foot by 18 inches. All buildings are built using scale scenes downloadable kits. Construction using phone board and card. <laughs> The Stratford and District Model Railway Club has actually bought several layouts to show this year. This one is Halfway St Andrew in a row gauge. It's a DCC controlled layout featuring a double loop. The layout includes a village, garage, church and station and is one for the public to operate. Their third and final instalment is Chippenham Junction in Engage. The name Chippenham Junction is derived from the fact that this area had several meeting points including one for the Carl branch line. If you pass through Chippenham today that's a completely different experience and you would never imagine that it was a junction. In fact all that remains is the two lines either side of the island platform seen here. This layout covers the track from the viaduct and embankment on the east to the point at which the branch line for Carl diverged from the main line. It includes all the buildings present during the period including Orwell House, the main station, goodshed, bacon factory, Westinghouse offices and factories plus the locomotive shed. <laughs> yeah. 
Next we move on to our first 009 gauge layout of the show, Lan Twai. Well that's why I assume this layout is, and my apologies if I have got the layout wrong, but the show guide doesn't seem to mention anything about this layout, and in fact, it suggests that there should be an N gauge layout standing in this place, which would make sense, as 009 is usually kept in a separate room of the show. Can't have it mixing with other scales. Next is a bit of nostalgia for those old enough to remember it. I'm looking at you, Dad. Triang Minic Motorways. This layout first appeared on the exhibition circuit in May 1996, and since then it has been to over 150 shows, including three appearances at Warley. We move across the room to Grafty Green by Tony Wormsley in O Gauge. Following the success of the Kent and East Sussex Railway, Colonel Stevens promoted the Weald of Kent Railway. This was to run northeast from Headcorn and eventually reach Sittingbourne. However, when construction had reached the edge of the village of Grafty Green, the money and enthusiasm ran out and the line got no further. The Lord of nearby Broughton, Morby, was sufficiently infused by the arrival of the WOKR that he had constructed his own private railway, the BMR, connecting with the WOKR at Grafty Green. It served various small industries on his estate. Both lines closed at the end of the 1950s and no trace can now be found. This layout is Tony's first attempt at O-Gauge modelling, and his rolling stock is a mixture of kit-built and ready-to-run models. We stick with O-Gauge, but coarse O-Gauge, and this is Templeford, brought to you by the Tandy family. The layout consists of a four platform through station with a voiding loop, small goods yard, two further goods sidings and motive power depot with turntable. Next is Rocher Junction by Michael Smith in G gauge. This layer was initially built so he could operate his stock indoors, although G scale refers to garden railway. It is not the largest scale, but probably the largest that is practical for indoor use. It runs through a controlled station, where there is also an automated shuttle at one end. After seeing members of the Home Guard, you'll be forgiven for thinking that this layout is Warmington on Sea. This is actually Stodmarsh, by Kevin and Judy Cartwright in O-Gage. Stodmarsh is based on a small village in East Kent. The railway was planned but never built. The layout is set in the run-up to D-Day and is made up of small dioramas, which means there is always something different to see. The local home guard, led by Captain Mannering, are creating chaos as usual. In the middle of this, there are lots of trains passing through and shunting wagons around. And so we move to the sites of the Great Western, with Lintor Town by Norman Gage in 4mm scale OO Gage. This is a fully DCC operated layout with working points and signals. It also features an indexable turntable. Uncoupling is totally hands off using the Dingen uncoupling system. The layout has working platform and yard lights and both the station building and signal box have interior working lights. Based on a fictionist GWR branch line terminus with a variety of locomotives and rolling stock in the area of the 1920s to 1930s, there is also the option to advance operation by a further decade to the 1940s. 
Here, City of Truro can be seen reversing onto the turntable, being turned round in preparation for running her next train. We stick to the wrestling region and go to Con Yard by Martin Morris in OO Gage. Throughout the 1970s, vast numbers of BR diesel hydraulic locomotives arrived at Swindon Works for disposal, some barely 10 years old. The layout is a condensed representation of the works area known as the Con Yard, with the lines of condemned locomotive and rolling stock, the large corrugated sea shop and the two electric yard cranes, the scene is set for a look back in time at a seldom modelled part of BR history. The layout is displayed in a full-size cut cab of a Class 52 Western locomotive. Closer attention to detail will reveal some quite amusing cameo scenes all over this layout including scenes such as the train spotter of camera, the workman breaking up the body of a van, and another one hammering away at some metal. There's also a moving forklift truck in one of the sheds, and vehicles run round in the background. Next is Stedham Mill by Paul Hopkins, TT gauge 3mm scale. The London, Brighton and South Coast Railway in the 1860s planned to extend its Chichester to Midhurst line to connect with the London and South Western at Halesby. In reality, the line was never built, but this model is an interpretation of what could have been. Centred around the planned immediate station at Steadham, it includes a junction between the LSWR and the LBSC system. The LBSC connection being electrified and served by services between Halesmere and Pulborough. The LSWR connection retains a rural atmosphere with services from Midhurst and Petersfield. The model was built to a scale of 3mm to 1 foot and can be operated in the Southern Railway or post nationalisation areas. We now move on to a particular favourite layout of mine and the boys, which is Sandy Bay by Kevin and Maggie Smith in Engage. Sandy Bay is a fixtures location on the North Yorkshire coast using elements of the Scarborough and Whitby Railway for inspiration. The line opened in 1885 and was operated by the North Eastern Railway. It took over totally in 1898. It closed on the 8th of March 1965 and a great deal of it is now a cycleway. It was decided to model a fixture station so that it could be included to have all the typical elements from along the line. On the left, trains enter the scene from Ravenscar Tunnel before running across a typical iron viaduct into Sandy Bay. The station is based on Scalby, 
with the runaround loop from Robin Hood's Bay added to give more operational interest. Trains depart on the ride through Cattleness Tunnel on their way up the coast. Sandy Bay Harbour included elements taken from the village of Staves. The beach huts and promenade are borrowed from Whitby. The signals and uncouplers are acted by moving permanent magnets under the board attached to wooden dowels. Much of the layout is built from recycled materials. In fact, it is built on an old flush panel door. The layout can be powered by a 12 volt sealed battery, meaning it can operate anywhere. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank Kevin and Maggie for letting the boy come round the back to see the other side of how this layout operates and for letting him pick a couple of locos to run round on the layout. My thanks also go to Kevin for some very useful layout building tips he gave me. I shall certainly be using them in the future. Now we're at Old Sarum, presented by Vintage Layouts. It's an O-gauge, free rail, coarse scale layout. Set on the southern region, with a western region branch, in Wiltshire, in early BR days of 1950 to 1955. The stock is mainly modern by Ace Trains, WJ Vintage and Dar State, but with some vintage Hornby from the late 1950s. And over the pond we go, to K Street Yard, by Carl's Holton and Sutton Model Railway Club. This is a 3.5mm scale HO gauge layout. K Street Yard is an idea for the Milwaukee Road switching location set between the late 1950s and the early 1970s. It is fictionally set in the north of Spokane in Washington State. Due to competition from other railroads, notably the GN and NP, the Milwaukee were left with a difficult location between city buildings, which requires a steep descent from the main line in order to, to enter the yard. Complicated switching is then needed to spot the various wagons in front of the correct industries dotted around the location. The buildings have been constructed from a mixture of Walford and Backman kits and some scratch building. Most have been heavily modified to suit the location to give a wide range of different things for cars. And so we move to the borders of Wales with St Mary's by Julian Neveson in 7mm scale over 16.5 gauge. This 7mm narrow gauge layout has been inspired by a long term fondness for the Welsh Pool and Landfair like railway. The Wild Swan book on the subject by Glyn Williams and the lovely models produced by Kevin Trim at Dorset Kits. The layout is a what-if scenario and is set in the summer of the 1930s and a modified version of the real Welsh Bull and Langfair like railway timetable has been used onto which has been grafted a service to St Mary's. Further traffic is provided from the quarry at Newbridge which is worked into St Mary's by the quarry company's own locomotives. Next we go to France and Aeon Pains. I think that's how you pronounce it. I'm not very good at French. It's a HOM gauge scale layout by John Davies. I assume that's not John Davies from the band Corn. And so we move on to Bow Legget Manor and Far End by Peter Cullen in 009 gauge. Bow Legged Manor is the country estate of Lord and Lady Fitz Tightly. Lord Fitz Tightly has established a narrow gauge passenger carrying railway in the old quarry on the estate. However, the enthusiastic and resourceful volunteers who help to run the railway have grown tired of going round in 
circles have constructed an extension down to the market town far end. Now they feel they have a proper railway and more scope for realistic railway operation. Sticking with 009 gauge, we have Port William to Braff Quarry by David Wright. This is the latest tabletop creation in 009 from David Wright. David wanted to model a slate quarry to complement the new Backman Hunters. And so I bring myself back to more poor French pronunciation with Saint Etienne Echo. I'm sure that's not how you say it. It's by Charles Inslee and it's in HOE gauge. This is set at the heart of a tramway, a 60 centimetre gauge railway system set in Pays de Car in eastern Normandy. The model, although freelance, is based on a number of northern French narrow gauge railways, in particular the Chemins de Fer, du Cable de Vent, le Chef Français Capé de Pontnet, and the Tramway de Pifon et Tulé, and the CF. De le bon I have no idea if I pronounced any of that correct. The station that's set in Montkewe is based on the harbour side station at Saint Valery on the Mitic HCF de le Bédon Cesson. The main station at Saint Valery is based on that at Le Coiton, also on the CFBS. Although the Cavadello system is closed, happily the other three lines are still with us and well worth a visit. The model is set in the 1950s and uses a variety of locomotives including the original tramway by cabbies and other types of locomotive. And now we're at Berry Fall and Sons by Joshua Haworth in 7mm fine scale low gauge. Representing a small portion of a fictionist tar distillery set somewhere in the west riding of Yorkshire in the late 1950s to early 60s with the rest of the works in the British Rail Exchange sidings being located off sea. Most of the motive power is ready to run, repainted into the house colours of desert sand, with three of the fleet coming with the layout in its condition and the rest slowly being repainted with the assistance of friends far more skilled in this work than the owner. There are also some kit-built models from a number of suppliers including Judith Edge and Mercian models. And scratch-built locomotives including a 1929-built Kerr Stewart. The majority of the locomotives are fitted with DCC sound, with some locomotives operating without sound while they await upgrades as funds allow. The layout was originally constructed by Dave, also known as Rustin, on RM Web. And now we come to our second D-Day layout of the exhibition, An Overlord by Chris Mead in OO Gage. As with the Great War some 30 years previously, the railways also played a key role in World War II, transporting people and material throughout the country, dispersing the returning troops rescued from Dunkirk, evacuating children from the London Blitz, and moving the men and material from their depots and assembly areas to the embarkation points for the D-Day landings of June 1944. Codename Overlord. 
Based loosely on Southampton and Portsmouth dockyards, the layout attempts to depict the hectic quayside activities to be found at many of the southern ports of England in the days surrounding the invasion of Normandy. Much of the variety and confusion of the moment are displayed. Tanks await loading, merchandised infantry columns search for the embarkation point. There are specialist vehicles such as bridge layers, rocket launchers, mine clearers and amphibious tanks needed to ensure the success of the landings. And we return to the Great Western with Tetbury by David Bison in Ogage. Tetbury is inspired by books on Great Western branch lines from Paul Caro and Stephen Randolph. These, together with the abundance of O-gauge ready-to-run models and kits from the prototype, drew the layout owner away from many years of continental modelling. While every attempt has been made to model the subject as accurately as possible, there are some simplifications to aid practically at this scale. Stock has been selected as seen in the BR era on the branch line between 1950 and 1964 when the line closed. All locomotives are DCC controlled and have sound modules fitted. Throughout the day, newer stock is introduced until finally rail bus operation remains. Sticking to Great Western, we have Hackworth and Trafalgar Terrace by David Goodwin and the Hackworth Model Railway Group in a row gauge. A model of a typical British Railway's Western Region large motive powered depot with both a churchwood, straight shed, roundhouse, maintenance shed and coaling tower. The MPD is surrounded by a locomotive work. Although the location is fictionless, it represents an area around Broadsley on the ex-GWR main line east of Moore Street in Birmingham. The layout features sound fitted locomotives, a working turntable as can be seen here, and suitable lighting and sound effects. Locomotives are mostly ex-Great Western types. Kings, castles and halls, down to small pannier tanks. Some are in a workday grime and some are in ex-works condition. To add variety, some of the locomotives preserved in bloody order by the British Transport Commission make the occasional entrance together with some exotic locomotives on interregional workings. Here we catch a pannier tank moving some coal <laughs> wagons up the embankment towards the coal load. Next is a part of the world I've never seen modelled before. Zalata Vinshut. Again, please forgive the poor pronunciation, and certainly it's done wrong. By David Paler in H.O. Cage. This is set in the north of the Czech Republic. Zalata is a frontier station with access to Poland and Germany. 
so there are a large number of international cross-border trains. Salata is also the terminus for a narrow gauge system. Next is Meacham by the Leamington and Warwick Model Railway Society in Engage. First exhibited in 2007, this layout has been evolving for the past 16 years. It is a continuous run layout based on an imaginary small industrial Derbyshire town. It features a through station, a branch line, a goods yard and a factory siding. The layout is still DC controlled which allows club members and visitors to run classic stock from the 1980s onwards. Behind the scenes there is a semi-automated food yard where the trains move into dead sections and can easily be moved forward by the touch of a switch. This enables plenty of variety and ensures that trains can be kept running at all times. While originally built to reflect the last taste of steam, the varied collection of stock and interests of the members has meant that they have tried to design it so that it would not be out of place in any period from the 1950s to the late 1960s. It is usually operated with the changes of loco and stock as the day progresses, reflecting the passing of time as steam gives way to diesel. Here we can see A4 Class C Eagle pulling into the station of an express train. That's a familiar blue tank engine with a couple of two small carriages arrives in the bay platform. As C Eagle waits, a BR Class Standard 4 passes by with its own working. And it just didn't work well. It really did not work well. Next is Richmond by Ian Spaulding and the Leamington and Warwick Model Railway Society in P4 scale. The prototype is the LSWR station of Richmond, Surrey, set in 1908. The layout will eventually show the terminus and mainline buildings but the layout initially being shown has part of the main line station, also known as the old station, the original goods yard and the new station platforms. The layout is modelled to P4 standards. It runs to a timetable sequence based on actual timetables of the era and is fully sick. Next, we come to Exeter St George, which is a 7mm fine scale O gauge layout by Chris Warner. This layout is simply modern image in southwest of England, with class 50s being a speciality. And that is certainly true, I believe in this footage alone you will see at least four class 50s.
After the arrival of the Class 20 and Class 37, we finally get to see another Class 50 come on to demo. The last of the Class 50s to hold on to the BR Large Logo Blue 50046 AX arrives at the demo. Now we move to Holland Beck by Ben Adlington in OO Cage. This is a modern image end to end layout based on the area south of the Humber in the north east of Lincolnshire. We now find ourselves at Hindley Yard by Stuart Bailey and Craig Holt of the Hindley Green Model Railway Group. Its layout is OO Gage. It's a fictionist layout based in North West England in the 1970s. A train of wagons arrives early in the morning, shunted by its mainline locomotive, which in turn uncouples from the train and either uses one of the steering points or trundles away to the nearest servicing facility. The shunters then get to work, splitting the train up, pushing and pulling the various vehicles into the warehouses for loading and unloading. Then a new train of wagons is formed, ready to hold away by a locomotive. It's a great opportunity to see the various wagon types in the use in the period model. The yard is DCC controlled with various sound fitted locomotives. Now we are at Nine Mills by David Forshaw in Engage. Built as an early 1960s steam diesel transition layout, Nine Mills has been widely exhibited and has featured in all the major modelling magazines. A few years ago, the owner acquired a good selection of 1980s freight stock and decided to adapt the layout to run the later BR sectorisation period as an alternative to its usual guise. Nine Mills 1990 is set between 1990 to 92 in the British Rail sectorisation period, with services operated by Intercity, Regional Railways and Rail Free. The layout is located on the West Coast Main Line, with the overhead electrification and the former steam depot represents Steam Town Railway Museum, which is now the base of the West Coast Railway. The coal and ash plant are accurate replicas of Canfield facilities are now the only ones still standing. The previous new 1960s diesel depot remains in use, now with regional railways and rail freight distribution. A 50 plus train fiddle yard capable of holding over 1,500 wagons or 600 coaches provides a steady flow of trains for the main line from its peak streamline code 80 track. 
We venture into southern region territory now with Swainton in EM Gage. This is by Richard Smith and the EMGS Heart of England Area Group. Swainton is a double track end to end layout with a small station and goods yard representing the southern main line in the New Forest between Southampton and Bournemouth in the early summer of 1960. The track plan is based on Hinton Admiral, but elements of Sway are included as well, hence the fiction's name. Like all self respecting southern stations, it is inevitably signed for somewhere else, in this case, the equally fictionist Millcliff on Sea. Trains are correct to period and range from stopping locals and pick up goods to through expresses, including the Bournemouth Bell, I bet it's somewhat shortened. All trains are hauled by locomotives known to have run on the line, including Drummond, Monsell, Bullied, and BR standard classes. Stock includes kit built models, as well as converted proprietary items. Operation is to a sequence based on actual timetables of the period, though with a significantly more frequent service and in prototypical manner as far as possible. The layout features hand-built point work using C and L components, authentic pattern, SR line side fencing and working signals, including ground signals, based on the LSWR and SR prototypes. All buildings are scratch-built, control conventional DC using controllers. And so we come to our last layout of the exhibition, Stamford East by Robin Fox in Engage. This layout is based on a real location, the former Great Northern Railway Terminus at Stamford in Lincolnshire, that once linked the town to the East Coast Main Line at Essendon. Oops. I hope you've enjoyed this video, and if you have, then please click the like button at the very least. If you want to do one better, then click the subscribe button, and hopefully I'll see you again sometime soon. Thanks for watching.